glad you're here. If you're joining us online, thanks for being here with us. If you're in the room, thanks for being here. Let's lift our voices together if you're able. Let's sing to the Lord. Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. We gathered in this place to honor you. To worship you in spirit and in truth. Thanks this morning. So glad you guys are here. You guys can have a seat and check out these highlights from yesterday. Today is the City Serve Rally. It was really more of a celebration than it was the beginning of City Serve. We've been serving in projects since February. It's an opportunity for our congregation to come together and go out and love on the community. We had over 45 projects planned this spring. 23 of them occurred today. 
So we've had people out in our community loving on neighbors. We've had people going into local schools, partnering with teachers, families from the school, and loving on their campus to make that look prettier. Our prayer is really that members of Providence would then take this concept and put it at work with life on mission every day, serving their community, looking for other projects so that they can connect. For Providence, we're not just these building walls, it's the people, and we want our people engaging with the community. So we need to take Jesus to a broken community and society that aren't, they may never come here. So it's our goal to take the love of Christ on mission in our lives. And serving alongside of people is just one way to do it. Yeah, Providence, let's praise God for what he did yesterday in the city. We sent out over 500 of our people all around the city, um, blessing the city. And so as we think about reaching our city, we're grateful for those of you that participated um, in uh, the project yesterday. Uh, we're praying for God to continue to bear fruit uh, right here in the city. And so we also want to reach our world. And um, we have a lot of people up here saying... We want to go somewhere else in the world. And so we, uh, we have our about 30 plus high school students that are uh, going to take their spring break to go to Thailand, Brooklyn, uh, Denver, and Boston. And so um, we want to pray uh, for these uh, teams this morning. So join me in praying. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you that we, you allow us to continue to, to go to places all over the world. Lord, we pray um, for each of these. Lord, we think about a place like Thailand that has millions and millions and millions of people um, without the gospel. But also these cities of Denver, and Brooklyn, and Boston are so many people without the gospel. And so we pray uh, that you would use us. We pray your hand upon each of us that um, we would have uh, spiritual conversations, the chance to share our story to bless people. Lord, we pray that we'd be a great encouragement to our partners for Angela and Rachel in Thailand, but also our church planners in these other places. So we pray for all the flights. We pray for the logistics. We pray for the health of the teams. Um, but most of all, we pray that you would do a mighty work in and through us, Father, as we go. And so uh, we pray you go before us in Christ's name. Amen. And so let's praise God for all of these. <clears throat> So my name is Phil. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the sending pastor, and um, we're so glad that you've joined us uh, this morning. Um, we say a special welcome to those of you online. If this is your first time and you've never connected with us, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. It's a connection card. We'd love you to fill that out and um, bring it to the welcome desk after the service. We have a gift for you. Um, or if you don't want to fill it out, you can go to pray.org slash connect. But uh, the bottom line is we want to get to know you. We want to connect with you um, here at Providence. And so, um, you know, a few weeks ago, we had a bunch of college students on the platform, and we sent them to Central Asia, uh, Tunisia, and London. And let me just tell you this, Providence, amazing trip. These students were awesome. And so let's just praise God for our students. They did so, so amazing on this trip. And uh, we're so grateful. And God is mobilizing them uh, for the mission. And so let's continue to praise God and let's sing about uh, the goodness of, of who he is and, and what he's done in our lives. So let's continue to worship.
This morning, as we sing that song and as we remind our hearts um, and our minds who God is, um, we just feel, we feel that reality that um, so many of us, if you're in this room, you've experienced one of those things at some point, and maybe even right now, feeling of hopelessness or just beaten down or tired or just feeling weary. And the reason for that is because we're such needy people. We always have been and we are today. We're, we're, in, we're needy because we need a rescue, because we're broken. Like we are, without King Jesus, without the hope that he gives, we're just broken and we're left there. But with King Jesus, we have everything that we need and everything that you're looking for today, he's it, he's the answer. So as we continue to respond in song and in worship, let's cast our eyes and our minds to Calvary, where he was hung on a tree, where he bled and died for each one of us. And as he rose again, so let's continue to sing this morning. Where 
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. that I've ever done, everything that I've ever said or thought, and you love me anyway. You forgive us, and also that we can be saved. Remind us today of all that you have given and all that you have suffered to make all of that true. And give us eyes to see those around us the way that you see them, the same way that you see us. Open our hearts this morning to receive the message that you have for us. And I pray to you in the precious name of Jesus. 
Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, it's good to see you, Providence family, and uh, if you are new here with us, we're really glad that you're here. Uh, thanks. Uh, we're really glad that you are our guest, and if you have in your hand a Bible, if you want to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, that'll be great. That's where we'll be this morning. If you don't have one in your hand, there's lots of Bibles in the, all these chairs, and uh, if you don't have one at home, take that home as a gift, but it is good to see you. I've been gone the last two weeks. I've been on a trip with a bunch of college students to the Middle East, and the Lord has uh, just been just... He was just incredibly gracious, and that grace is something that I just feel compelled that I need to say just a few words of just affirmation and, um, and gratitude to you as a church family. Uh, we believe that the Bible is very clear about a lot of things, such as his mission, that he's the only way, and that everyone in the world needs to hear about Jesus. We also know that the power comes from prayer, and so we know that you care about the mission. We know that you pray for teams as they go, and we're incredibly thankful for that. We also know that to take as many college students as we did, which was about 45, uh, to three different, uh, three different um, well, continents, um, actually, um, or at least two, it, it, that it really takes a lot of money. And the fact is, is when you open up the Bible, what you see is that he tells us to prioritize our own resources and what he gives to us to manage, uh, first to him and then to our future, to save for the future, and then to live wisely with what is left. And as a church family, you have been so incredibly faithful to give because you care so deeply about this. And we seek to leverage those dollars in order to send people overseas as well as to support people overseas. And so I was in a city that I can't tell you where we're at right now because I'm on camera and it goes online. But if you want to know where we're at, I, we can talk afterward. Uh, but it's a place to where it's just populated with a lot of refugees who have war-torn go through incredibly difficult places in life. And five years ago or six years ago, we were there and um, we were able to partner with one church planner, um, a, a man uh, who we've seen his story. And, uh, and, over the, and, and there were two little house churches that he sought to shepherd. He was sharing his faith, a brand new faith to him even. And and today we were there, and now as a church family, we support five church planners, and there are 42 churches in this one city that have all sprung up in the last five years. And, and the Bible tells us in 3 John that those that we give to and pray toward and partner with and send to, that their fruit, their fruitfulness actually gets to be enjoyed by us as well. And so I'm just incredibly thankful for your faithfulness. It was amazing to see what he has what he's doing there, and um, we have some amazing college students, and so so incredibly thankful. Uh, so let me pray, okay? Father in heaven, we bow before you, and or for every act of faithfulness that was inspired by your love and your spirit within our hearts, we just give you all the praise and the glory. We know that you're the only one, ultimately, to thank. You're the only one to praise. You're the only one to adore and worship. And yet we see what you're doing around the world, and we see what you're doing in our own hearts, we see what you're doing in our families, and even in this room, and we just say thank you that you have been so kind to us as a people over so many years now. You've been so kind to us as a people. And I ask now, as we open up your word, that you would create within us a curiosity for how to overcome these enormous obstacles in front of us. Would you help us to see the story as we need to see the story? I pray, Father, that you would help those who have something just enormous in front of them, an obstacle so big and brutal they just don't know what to do. Would you give them hope? 
And for those who feel that their life is utterly obscure, that there's really nothing of significance in front of them, would you help them to see through this story how little acts of faithfulness and days of obscurity are preparing us for some of the biggest days ahead? And so we look to you in faith. Speak through weakness, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, everybody, everybody loves a story with a rescue. I know I do, and I know you do. And the reason is because that's the stories that we remember. We love to see and observe somebody who lays down their life or their freedom, their security, their comfort, their time, their energy in order to rescue someone else. It's always has been inspiring, and it always will be inspiring. And that's why the Bible is so compelling. It's because it's a rescue story. From the very beginning, when people needed a rescue, God says, I'm going to send you a rescuer. When we open up the New Testament, we find that, but there's through the Old Testament, all these years of waiting for this ultimate rescuer, we find God raising up in different seasons these imperfect people who rescue God's people. He uses them to do these remarkable things and they're compelling stories. And every time that God uses one of these human beings to rescue, what's happening is he's creating a deeper level of anticipation for the day that God was going to send his ultimate rescuer. And that's exactly what he did. Now, after stories such as Noah and Joseph and Moses and David and Goliath, Esther, who we'll look at next week, what we find is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's the greatest rescue. It's the only rescue that matters to every single one of us because we're in need of being rescued. And so this series, as we're looking through just different rescues in the Old Testament that all culminate with Christ, of course, all of this will also culminate the series on Easter. And Easter is a pretty big deal around here, so I want to tell you a few things that you can anticipate. Next weekend is Palm Sunday, and so Palm Sunday night, we have a service in here. It starts at 6 o'clock. We're going to pray, we're going to worship, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper, and it's going to be amazing. I just promise you, it'll be amazing. It's going to feed your soul, and so I encourage you to prioritize that. Five days later is Good Friday, where we remember Jesus' sacrifice, his death, his substitution for us. And around the building, there'll be different stations that you can go, and there'll be places where you can, uh, it'll take you for your planning. It'll be open all day, but it'll take you about 45 minutes to go through each to actually read and to pray over what you're seeing, what you're feeling with your hands, to remind us of what he did to prepare our hearts to celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead. On Easter weekend, there's going to be five different Easter services, okay? There's going to be a service on Saturday at 7 o'clock, the three on Sunday morning, and then one on Monday night at 7 o'clock. And what I want to ask you is that if you are inviting someone, invite that person to the service that they can attend and then come to that service. But if you are free to be able to attend the service other than this one or 930, it would be really helpful, if possible, to come on Saturday at 7 or I know it's a big stretch, in particular for those who are at 11, but Sunday at 8 a.m. It's like the best service, I promise. And um, <laughs> it'd be wonderful for you to be able to serve those who will be coming. There's always an influx of people on that weekend. But this morning, we get to look at the one who is greater than David. David and Goliath may be the most popular story in the Bible, even for people who've never read the Bible. It's become the cultural metaphor for overcoming impossible odds. We hear about it anytime you see the little guy and then you see what they have to go up against. And we're like, wow, that's sort of a story of David and Goliath. In the marketplace, the mom and pop shop compared to Walmart, the little guy, can the little guy survive? Sometimes it's even talked about in sports when a 16 seed goes up against a number one seed. They're like, wow, this is, this is, this is a little battle between David and Goliath. You even find it in places like a hospital or a ward where everyone has cancer, where it just seems like there's one person and each individual is sort of like a little David and they have to overcome this enormous obstacle and how are they going to do it? What's interesting is we love when we find stories like this one where the little guy wins and yet many of us, even though we may be familiar with the story of David and Goliath, Many of us carry conclusions from this very story that are not the main point of the story. And as a result, the power that is available in these words in our life and through our life, they always seem to remain just out of reach. And so let me encourage you to consider maybe a different way to view it. 
And that is before you can be a David, that you recognize that you are the Goliath that must die with Christ and be resurrected with him and your heart can be made new. And so, starting in verse four of 1 Samuel chapter 17, it says, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span That's nine feet tall, and he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders, and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's 16 pounds. And his shield bearer went before him, and he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So one of the things that I love to do is to show you how I even have my quiet time, which is how I write these sermons. What I do is I read verses and then I write a truth statement, things that, that must be true on the basis of the words that we just read. So if you ever wonder, like, oh, how come he makes those points? I just read that and I think this is the, this is the truth that comes out. And what, from those verses, let me give you this truth. I know there's many others, but this one is, is, is also true, and that is that God honors those whose heart is set on him. He sets his favor on those who set their heart on him. Now, this battle with this man named Goliath, it occurred on a real day in a real valley called Elah. This valley that you see here today, of course, they didn't have these buildings back then, but there were, it's a valley and there's mountains on either side of it. Israel would have been on this side over here and camped near Jerusalem, Bethlehem. And over on this side would be all of the Philistines nearest to Gath. We're told that this man named Goliath would come out into this valley and he would shout these very words, give me a man. And eventually, this is where it all took place. This is where David and Goliath fought. This is where he cut off his head. It's an amazing place. It's a true place. It's a real place. And this is where we meet this man named Goliath. And what we find, it's a really amazing thing. And you should ask this question. You should ask this question is that, he, is that all this time is spent telling us he's nine feet tall. He, he's this barrel of a guy. He's, he, has, he has armor everywhere. He's holding this spear. On the end of his spear, there's the tip of the spear that weighs as much as the heaviest bowling ball. Like if you went over to the bowling alley and you needed to borrow a ball and they have that rack of balls and you look for the one that has a 16, it's, it's the heaviest one they allow you to use there. Well, if you went in there with a stick and you stuck it into the hole of the bowling ball, lifted it up, now it would be round so it wouldn't, wouldn't do so well, but, but that ball he fashioned of iron into the shape of, of, of a spear, of a tip. And this is, this is the... This is, the, this is the weapons that's being used by this man. He's throwing it around like a dart. But you've got to ask a question. Why devote eight verses in the Bible to tell us about the man's size of his body, the size of his armor, the, the size of his voice that seemed to echo through the valley for 40 days in the morning at night? Why invent, Why invest so much time in the Scripture telling us You should ask these questions. These are all very important questions because he could have said in one verse, and there was a really big guy with a long spear. That's what he says. He just spends more words doing it. So why does he do it? And it's because God in 1 Samuel has been teaching his people a lesson, a lesson that began at the beginning of the book. You see, for the first 15 chapters of 1 Samuel, what we find is Israel is in rebellion against God. They're not walking with God. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. And one of the ways that they they showed their own rebellion was they looked around at all the different nations around them and said, you know what? They all have their own king. They all have someone to go out and fight for them. 
And all we have is a God who says he's our king. We want a king so that we can be like all of the other nations. And God looks at what their request was, and he sees it as further demonstration of their rebellion. And he sends in one of his prophets named Samuel, and he says, I want you to tell the people what will take place if I give them what they're asking for, and that is a king. I want you to tell them what's going to do to your sons and daughters, your wealth, and the future generations of Israel. I want you to tell them what's going to happen in terms of the social chaos that's going to, to come over them when there is a human being instead of the creator of the universe that's the king over the land. And what we find is a remarkable thing. When they hear all of the possibilities and the promises of all of the bad that's going to come, they yell back at Samuel and they say, no. But there shall be a king over us. That we shall also be like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. In other words, God had come to them and he says, I am creating you to be a holy nation, a, a, a holy people, a people that is set apart, that's different than the other nations so that when they see your blessing, they come to you and they say, what's the source of your blessing? We don't even have a king. And they say, yeah, we do have a king. He's better than all the kings. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And they said, we don't want to be different. We want to be like all the other nations. This would be like a church saying, we don't want to be holy. We want to be like the world. We want somebody that's going to fight our battles. When we need a tall guy, a big guy to go out and fight on behalf of everyone else, we want one of those. And so... What happens? Well, they choose Saul. And they chose Saul for his body. Okay, now there was no such thing as GQ back then, but if there was, Saul would have been January edition, front cover, right? It'd be like this, something like that, right? He's, he'd be all ready, right? When people looked at Saul, and they looked at the, all the people, and they said, we need a king, who are we gonna pick? All of a sudden, they, they, they saw this guy who just towered a foot, his entire head above all the rest of the army. And they're like, wow, you're really tall. You can probably make good decisions. <laughs> we want you to be our king. And he's a train wreck. Almost immediately, the weight and the light that's cast upon the leader became too heavy for his hollow heart. And so he began to lead the people in rebellion against God. And so God sent Samuel to another man named Jesse. And he said... Saul can't be king forever. I need a new king. I need to anoint a new king. I want you to go. There's a guy named Jesse. He's got a bunch of boys, and I want you to anoint the one that I tell you. He sits down. And he says, all right, Jesse, march him in front of me. He's got eight sons. They leave one out in the field because he's just the runt. They bring him in, and first there's Eliab. And, and Samuel, even Samuel, he's like, ba-bam, there he is, February edition, GQ. <laughs> Eliab, he's, he's like attractive, he's articulate, he's walking in, he carries himself with confidence, he's the firstborn, he's, I mean, he's ready, he is ready, so much so that 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6, tells us that he thought to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And God says to him, Samuel, are you kidding me? Like, we've done tall already. We've done tall. We've done beautiful. How about we try godly? Let's try godly. Amen. Verse 7. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. After seven brothers are declined, they're like, you got any others? Like, we got one more. He's out with the sheep. He goes, you got to get him. David comes in. But you understand what's been happening in the field. When he's been out in the field, what's happening is he's been developing a heart for God. He's been cultivating a relationship with God. He's been, he's been creating understanding within him of the ways of God, how God is comforting, how God is listening to his prayers and answering his prayers. And so here's somebody whose heart is inclined towards the Lord. He comes in and he says, that's the one. They anoint him as king. And the very next thing that happens is the Bible gives us an eight verse description of Mr. March. Goliath, another physical description of this brilliant specimen. And he's doing this to test the reader. 
What's the test? Who do you admire? Who do you fear? Who do you want to become like? If you can prioritize your time in order to fortify one area of your life, mind, body, soul, what do you pick? That's the point. You and I are all, we are all gonna spend our time in whatever, however many days we have left fortifying some area of our life. And what I want you to know is this. is that when you stand before God Almighty one day, and you will, and so will I, the only thing that you have is money on this earth, if the only thing that you have is power, if the only thing you have is a body because you're at the gym all day, every day, on that day, you will have nothing. The only thing you bring with you on that day is what's in your heart, a heart that's cultivated toward him or a heart that doesn't care about him. And on that day, the heart is exposed. So let me urge us as a church family to prioritize growing a heart for God. Why? Because he honors those who set their heart on him. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says to Timothy, bodily training is of some value, that godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life, but also for the life to come. You see what he's saying? Go to the gym. It's a good thing. <laughs> Exercise. It's a good thing. There is value in it. There's some value in it. It's good to be healthy. He says, but let me tell you something. You, you have to prioritize time where you can really address your heart. You can really address your body. You should spend more time on your heart. And not only that, have you ever gone to the gym and, find, and, and, and watch people at the gym? It's really an interesting thing. You can tell who knows what they're doing and people who don't, right? If you don't know what you're doing, you spend a whole lot of time walking. Like you're getting a ton of steps in, but you're just kind of like walking around to different machines and you're like, ooh, that one hurt. I don't want to do that again. Let's see. Let's try this over here. And you just keep walking around. And it's like, wow, it's been an hour. So I guess it's time to go. And you just walk out. And there's very little accomplishment. Very little, like not much has happened. But you notice people, when they have a plan, they walk right in and they're like, all right, this is what I'm doing today. And they get right on it. And it's amazing. The same amount of time. It yields a totally different result, and the same thing is with the soul. My question is this. If it's true that we should prioritize our heart even more than our body, if it's true that we need a plan in order to work on our body, then what is your plan to work on your heart? It doesn't just happen. You have to have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, we want to help you find a plan. My plan every day for many years now, decades now, is wake up. And I start really with the same prayer and say, God, thank you for allowing me to wake up and living, to live in your world today. I know this is your world and you're just. Things are gonna happen today that one day that I'm gonna be held accountable for. So help me to live in light of your presence, your nearness, your justice, your goodness, your, your, your truthfulness. And I walk downstairs and I open the Bible and I have a plan. I don't just go, um, there. All right, let's see what this is. No, I have a plan. What am I gonna read today? I know what I'm gonna read before I get down there. If you don't have a plan, we have a plan. They're free and they're in the lobby. There's only two weeks left of that plan. You say, well, I'll just wait till the next one. But that plan in its last two weeks is better than your plan if you don't have a plan. So pick that one up and use it for two weeks and get ready for next week when we look at Esther. Have a plan. And what I do is I write statements down. I read it and I just write true statements. This is true about God. This is true about man. This is true about what's, what, what I'm reading. And then I just pause and I pray, God, Help me to be that kind of man or help me to not to be that kind of man. Have a plan. Well, let's keep going. Samuel, I'm sorry, Jesse has eight boys, as I said. Three of them are in the army and he wants to know how they're doing. So he sends David to check on them. Verse 21 says this, I'm sorry, verse 20. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in the charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked to them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. 
All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free of taxes in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and his anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not a... Just a word. And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. What I want you to see here, which may be a little hard to see, but it's so true and it's so important for all of us, and that is that God is patient with our divided heart. I know David is heroic, but there's a reason that David can't be our savior, and it's because he was a sinful man too. Many of us in the room, we have a big heart for God, but we also have a big heart for other things that we wish we didn't have a big heart, and so our heart is divided. So David, he arrives, and he arrives just in time to hear Goliath. And you have to understand, every time Goliath went out and he yelled, give us one man, they all looked at Saul because he was their big dude who was supposed to go out and fight their battles. But Saul had no heart, but what he did have was money, the ability to absolve people's taxes, and he had daughters. And so he set a bounty, and he said, I'll tell you what, anyone who goes out there, no taxes, lots of wealth, and you can actually become part of the royal family. And when David heard the reward, he spoke. And this is really important. This is the very first thing that the Bible records that David said. Now, he's close to 20 years old, so he's been talking his whole life, but this is the first thing that the Bible says, this is the first thing he said. Just imagine this. What do you think, David, man after God's own heart, what do you think the first thing that he said? And what he said was this. What do I get to kill him? What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Oh, he gets to the fight. He goes, man, he's defying the armies of the living God. But then notice what happens. He goes to another person. He goes, hey, can you clarify again? What do we get? And this is when Eliab, his brother, comes in, and Eliab's all uptight with him. He's like, man, you got like three sheep. Why'd you leave them? You know, just your little few sheep. He's probably irritated still because he watched David get anointed instead of him. He doesn't fight with his brother. He goes to another man, and he says, all right, third time. Let me just get this straight. What do I get if I kill him? So notice what's happening here. What do I get? The honor of God. What do I get? What do I get? Now, you have to understand what's happening here. This is a window into David's lifelong struggle. You see, we have 38 more chapters on the life of David, and so you can find that these are just seeds that are gonna blossom and sprout the rest of his life. And what you find in David is this, is he had an atypical heart for God, an unusual heart for God, but he also had a very typical ambition for money and sex and pleasure and security. And these things wage war for the next 38 chapters of his life. And what you'll find is this, is that whenever God's honor within his heart on that day is elevated above his ambitions for money, ego, pleasure, and security, David's lifestyle is absolutely noble. And every time and whenever his ambitions supersede God's honor within his own heart, He lives a life that is utterly shameful. He's one of the worst fathers recorded in the whole Bible. An adulterer, murderer, liar, cheater. Like us. Hard for God. Yeah, we got these things within us. We want things, and those things can destroy us. And there's this... Enormous tension within our heart. And what you find in David is, you find all that in David, but what I hope you can see is like always be looking. What does it say about God? And what is this about God is how remarkably patient is he towards us? 
He's so patient towards us. So let me encourage us to plead with God to unite our heart. Do not lie to yourself to say that whatever your heart wants is what you must chase. Many of us wake up and go, I don't want to have a quiet time. So we don't. I want to look at pornography. And so we do. You are not a slave to the desires of your heart. For those of us who are in Christ, he says, we were slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to righteousness. We have, we have a new ticker. We have a new heart. It still has some of those old ambitions, but we can lean upon God and we can say no to all of those temptations and we do not have to soil our life with seasons that bring immense shame. You don't have to live that way. And David, even this David who's, who's so complex because he's all over the fact, I want stuff, like, and yet I, God, God is his honor, his honor, his honor, but I really want money, but God, and his whole life is doing this. He teaches us in the journey how to live. And what he does is he teaches us to say this. Every morning, you gotta take your heart, you gotta slam it to the ground, you gotta wrestle it down, you look up to God and say, quick, fix it while it's on the ground. Amen. Instead of saying, well, I'm just gonna let it do what it wants, and I'm just going to chase it around all day. Whatever it wants today, that's what I'm going to do. No, notice what David, the same David prays, Psalm 86, Psalm 86, verse 11, unite my heart to fear your name. Why does he say this? It's because it's not. It's divided. He has some inclinations for this, some, some of these desires, some of these desires for God, and he's saying, God, I'm so divided. What happens is my life is so inconsistent. I need you to unite my heart to fear your name. I wake up in the morning and I want to read the word and I wake up in the morning and I don't want to read the word because I want to read something else. And so he prays, God, incline my heart to your testimonies. You see what he's doing? He's saying, I am going to take my heart and make it subservient to the rule of Christ as opposed to me being subservient to its wicked desires. Yeah. Let me encourage you to plead with God to unite your heart. For when God's honor is not central in our heart, we are moving towards a lineup of regret. Well, let me, let, me, let me keep going because the best is yet to come. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. And David sent to, said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. I just love his confidence. Your servant will go and fight with his Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it from his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. And your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And then Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go for he, he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. So David put them off. And then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine and the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came, 
drew near to meet David. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet this Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead and the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling, with a stone, and struck the Philistine, killed him. What do we do with this? Well, a point, a truth that's so significant, and that is that this, that God uses faithfulness in lonely moments to prepare us for the big moments. Today, you are not wasting your life. You guys know that life is what happens when you're preparing to live, right? You know, David woke up this day and he didn't think, this is gonna be my famous day. He went with some cheese sandwiches to his brothers. That's what he thought his day was about. And suddenly something happened on that day, but because he had prepared during obscure days, normal days, he was faithful in the little things, suddenly he had the internal fortitude when it was called upon, when it was needed to step up and to rescue his people. David is brought before Saul, and he says, you don't have to fear, I'm gonna go fight him. Saul says, you can't. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're only a youth, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Now, David has been working part-time at the palace just for a couple years, playing his harp in order to soothe Saul's soul. In other words, what he's saying here is this, this is the champion of the world, and you play harp. You can't go fight him. And I just love what he says. Like, he needs a reason, a reason to give confidence to the king of why I can go out there. Notice what he says in verse 34. Your your servant used to keep sheep. No, wrong line, David. That's not what you lead with. Like, I'm really good as a shepherd. But why I mention it, why it's so important is because it's critically important. And the reason it's critically important is because what he's doing is he's saying this. During those days when it was quiet and there was no one looking at me, when I was all by myself, I developed a relationship with God and I saw his ways. I learned what he was like. I saw his power. I saw how he delivered me time after time after time as I called upon him. And as a result of that Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. In other words, it was his memory of God in his life in those quiet, lonely moments that prepared him for the day that we all said, now that's his big day. Do you, are you being faithful today? You say, A lot of people ask me, what should I do today to prepare for my big moments? Be faithful with what God put in your life today. You got a job, go work it and do it well. See what he's doing in your life. Be faithful with what is in front of you today. All those lonely days with God prepared him for this day. We're literally watching this in basketball games all the time. We are seeing today at the end of games, at critical moments, when the lights are on and somebody is at the free throw line, we are seeing today who practiced in the dark. When nobody was watching, when no one was cheering, when they're just another one and then another one, simply developing a rhythm, developing just... Muscle memory over and over and over and over again. And you see those people who didn't practice in the dark and they get put on the stage when it's time to shine. And you can tell who's prepared in the dark and who hasn't. Many battles in our life are won in the quiet places long before the battlefield. So Saul tries to armor him up, and he says, this is not going to work. He takes his stones. And you imagine he goes up, on this, goes up on this field. You imagine everybody's like, oh, this is terrible. First, there's the army of Israel. They become slaves if David loses. They're like, we're sending him up? And then there's the army of the Philistines. They're looking like, hey, we heard somebody's coming up, but all I see is some, somebody's kid broke loose over there. And then there's Goliath himself. He comes out and he goes, seriously? He's, he's embarrassed. He's humiliated. He's like, I'm the champion of the world. I come out here and you're, you're going to throw me a stick like I'm a dog? This is exactly what he says. Of course, David speaks to him with such confidence. He says, I want you to know this day the Lord is going to deliver you in, into my hand. I'm going to strike you down and I'm going to cut off your head. And then he did. And he tells us why he did all this. He says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. There really is a king around here 
and it's nothing to do with a human. You're gonna see him. A providence, we read these stories through the lens of the hero. We all look at ourselves and say, I'm gonna be a David. All kinds of stories like, hey, God puts Goliath in your life to find your inner David. But isn't it true that Goliath is the incarnation of our fallen self much more than David? We're all born at enmity with God, proud, defiant, just like Goliath. I know that many of us have giant problems, but you also have to understand we are a giant problem. You ask any really good leader, what is the hardest part about leadership? And if they're really a good godly leader, what they're gonna say is this, it's leading me. It's leading me. Because we're all Goliath. And until we are rescued from being that Goliath, we simply can't be the David that we all want to be. And this is why David cannot be our ultimate rescuer. We needed someone better than David, greater than David, truer than David, and we got one in Jesus Christ. He was the true and greater son of Bethlehem. Oh, David was consecrated in the fields, but Jesus came from heaven. David was ridiculed by his seven brothers, but Jesus was ridiculed and rejected by all mankind. David became a substitute warrior for a cowardly king, but Jesus became our substitutionary sacrifice by dying for our sin and rising from the dead. David shared his victory with the army of Israel, but Jesus shares his victory with all who put their faith and trust in him, not only today, but forever. The real giant in our lives was our alienation to God and with God and the penalty that we owe before him. And Jesus paid that debt and he reconciled us to God, which is why he is the greater servant, the greater substitute, the greater warrior, and he's the greater king. And because he defeated the real giant in our own lives, we can face all these lesser giants like David. So let me encourage you this morning to put your faith and trust in Christ. If you have not already done so, you simply call out to him in faith and saying, I believe and I put my faith in Jesus. I believe you died and rose again. The day is coming when we will stand before God and only those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ in this life will stand securely there in heaven. And the good news for those of us who have trusted him is he tells us to come together as a church family and to tell one another that we have put our faith and trust in Christ and he's given us a way to do that. It's called baptism. Next week and then the week after, Palm Sunday and Easter, we're gonna baptize a number of people in each of our services. And if you've already put your faith and trust in Christ and you want to obey him in proclaiming your faith without words through a symbol of being buried and rising out of the water, in order to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And you can have that opportunity. You can go to pray.org slash baptism, and we'd love to start a conversation with you this week. And finally, let me encourage us to sing. We're gonna sing right now. We need to worship Jesus as the one and only rescuer because I'm convinced of this, that you do not need to know that many things in life for your life to matter, but you do need to know the one or two things that matter the most and give your whole life to those things. And I tell you today that there is nothing more consequential and essential to life than the authority and supremacy of Jesus Christ who we're gonna sing to now. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you, our maker. We acknowledge you and we praise you. And we ask God that you would do just as what we read from Paul's lips, that he's been crucified with Christ and we no longer live, but the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Would you help us, Father? Would you help us? Help us to be faithful in the quiet places. Pray that you would help us to prioritize our heart. I pray that you would help us to pass the test of what we genuinely desire and long to be as a man or as a woman. And Father, I pray now as we sing that you would give us strength and energy Lord, to sing to you in response to the things that we've heard. That we can sing to you because you've already won the victory. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing.
Jesus, you are near. The peace of God surrounding me, casting out all fear. Providence, you know, Brian mentioned that he was uh, in Central Asia last week. I was there with him, and um, it's a Muslim country, and um, pretty much everybody we talk to is fighting to get to God. 
I mean, they're constantly fighting. And, um, you know, for those of us who have put our trust in Christ, we don't have to fight because he fought for us. Okay, because of his death and resurrection, we have victory. Um, and so we don't have to fight. We can rest in the shadow. And so if you're here this morning and this is the first time you've heard this news, or maybe you're fighting and you can't find rest, Jesus is your rest. And we would love for you to put your trust in Christ. And if you did that, or if maybe you have questions, or if you're online, um, we would love to pray with you, answer any questions you have, um, connect with you. And so you can go to pray.org slash connect, and we would love to, to spend some time with you. Um, as Brian mentioned, we have a lot of uh, services over the next few weeks for Easter. And so you can go to Easter at Providence.com and find all the information um, for that. Uh, and then if you go out there by the welcome desk or all over the church are these Easter at Providence cards, they're invite cards. We would love for you to invite one of your four or neighbors, friends, this is a great time to invite. Uh, and so we're gonna make space uh, for those folks on Sunday morning at 9:30 and 11. But we'd love for you to take some of these cards and invite your friends. And so let me pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for grace upon grace. Thank you for Jesus, that we don't have to fight to get to heaven. We don't have to work to get to heaven. But we just have to put our trust in you, and we're thankful for that. We can rest in your grace. And so I pray this week that you would help us to rest in that grace. And Lord, that we would Lord, spend time in your word. Lord, spending time with you and that you would help us this week um, to overcome in, in whatever we're facing. And so, Lord, help us to be a blessing to somebody this week as well as we, uh, as we live our lives this week. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great day.